of the day, we would like to encourage all live audience to participate in our first pre-panel discussion poll. What's a realistic year for Asia to achieve net zero? 2030, 2040, 2050, 60, or 2070? Remember to join in the poll and also join in the discussion by posting your questions in the right-hand side of the screen for all our panel panelists. You may also join the conversation on socials by using the hashtag Root to Net Zero and Net Zero Asia. Let's welcome our first moderator of the day, Eloise Burnett. She's the Senior Asia Manager of Carbon Trust. And Eloise manages the UK government's ASEAN Low Carbon Energy Program, working across the region to drive energy efficiency and green finance. She's focused on growing the Carbon Trust work and impact in Asia. Previously, Eloise was Program Manager in London for the offshore wind team, working with governments, wind farm developers, and regulators to increase the evidence base and reduce the risk of offshore wind projects. Additionally, Eloise was a technology manager for the world-leading offshore wind accelerator, Carbon Trust flagship research, development, and innovation program. In the OWA, she managed multiple research projects with external technology experts that were aimed at further reducing the cost of wind energy and renewables. Eloise has been working on program delivery in the sustainability field for more than nine years and has notable experience working in the field of energy efficiency in industry and the sustainable energy efficient refurbishment of buildings. She will be moderating the panel discussion, Carbon Footprinting and Net Zero Target Setting, featuring expert panelists from Mahindra Group, Ambition Group, Decathlon, SBTI. Let's welcome Eloise. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you for that kind introduction and welcome to all our audience members today. It's great to see so many of you with us today. So welcome to the session on carbon footprinting and net zero target setting. The purpose of this session is really to break down these sometimes intimidating concepts into digestible chunks with the help of some of the leading lights in the region. But I think the best thing to do is start with some definitions. What are we talking about when we talk about footprinting and net zero target setting? So footprinting is just the basic tool for calculating the environmental impact of something, whether that something um, is your organization, your value chain, your supply chain, uh, a service, event, a product. What you need to do is ensure that something has a clear defined boundary that so that we can define the footprint. Um, once you have done that, you can then uh, ma manage that, monitor that and move forward and understand how that footprint is going to change. And what about net zero target setting? A net zero target is a target of completely negating the amount of greenhouse gases produced by your company's activity. This has to be achieved through a multi-pronged activity, multi-pronged strategy, starting with energy efficiency, conserving your energy use, employing renewables, looking at changing your business model, innovating, and then only then look to implement methods of reducing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere through what we call carbon dioxide removals, which can be both man-made and natural. The Carbon Trust has quite literally worked with hundreds of organizations setting targets and we have footprinted tens of thousands of organizations, product, products, events, services. We know it can be complex, but it also is highly achievable. And what we are discussing today are really the fundamentals. But the fundamentals and the critical elements that drive your corporate sustainability and ensure that you can move forward on this journey. We're going to approach the subject today, breaking it down into four kind of viewpoints or areas. Firstly, getting started. What can you do as an organization to really get to begin your, begin your corporate sustainability journey if you haven't started? Then looking at ambition. Where do you and your company want to go? How fast and um, how ambitious are you going to be? And how do you set that um, within your organization and communicate that with both your colleagues and senior management and also your customers? And then implementation, looking at how you then turn those plans, those ambitions into actual action. Um, it's no use having these footprints or targets written down on paper without them, without them um, converting into tangible action and progress. And then finally, I really want to put a nice Asia lens onto everything that we're talking about today. What are the unique challenges, stresses, risks that an Asian organization is going to feel in this whole process? And so 
and hopefully that's going to spark all sorts of interests and also inspire you to take action. But that's enough from me. Um, I have much more interesting people here to, to answer these questions. Um, and it's, so it's now time to turn to our panelists. And I'm honored today to have with us Envision Group, Decathlon, Mahindra Group, and CDP. I won't do, um, I won't do the honor of uh, introducing them. I'll let them do that themselves. They will do a much better job than I do, uh, I will. So if I could please ask our panelists just to quickly introduce themselves one by one. And if I could ask Judy Zhao from Decathlon to start. Thank you. Hello, thanks, Eloise. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Judy. I'm uh, from uh, Decathlon China. Um, Decathlon is a French company. Actually, we are a provider of uh, sports products and services worldwide. Um, I work in a uh, sustainable development department uh, for several years already and uh, focus on energy efficiency products globally. So I also participate participated the implementation of a science-based target for the customer supply chain, building trajectories and the detailed action planning. So very nice to be here to, to share with you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Chidi. If I could ask Anirban to, um, to introduce himself from Mahindra Group. Thank you, Lois. Uh, I'm Anirban Ghosh. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer of the Mahindra Group. It's a group of companies headquartered in India uh, across a range of industries like automotives, agricultural tractors, finance, software, construction, and a few others, these being the big ones. Uh, we have quite a job on our hand to get to becoming carbon neutral by 2040, which is our commitment. And that's what keeps me awake at night. <laughs> As a closing uh, bit of introduction, I'm a devoted customer of Decathlon, and I'm delighted by all the sustainability work that they're doing now. <laughs> Thank you, Nirban. Um, now handing over to Huindang Zhao, please. Hello, uh, my name is Huindang. So uh, I'm the EH director for Evision Group. Uh, I'm in charge of the EHS carbon neutral and also ESG for the group. And the uh, Evision Group, uh, the headquarters is based in Shanghai, in China. And the, uh, it is the green technology pioneer and also is a leader in terms of green technology. So uh, there are some, uh, 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 have seen the business the, uh, in, in Evision. So the first one is Evision Energy, uh, it's a smart uh, wind power and energy storage system company. And also the, the, the another uh, very big part is the uh, we call the Evision Digital, so which has developed a world leading uh, uh, IoT system for the energy operating system. But also we have a very uh, uh, smart battery company uh, division we call the Evision uh, AESC. And also we have uh, run a leading global green uh, technology investment firm. Okay, uh, and finally we also around uh, the uh, Evision uh, uh, Virgin uh, Racing uh, Formula E team. So that is the, uh, the component of the, all the uh, Evision group. And then uh, in Evision group, so we have a very, uh, how to say, uh, committed slogan. We, 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 we want to, uh, to promote the wind power and the energy storage as the new core and also the batteries and the hydrogen fuel as the new new oil, and also a smart IoT uh, uh, the enabled uh, new grid. So, so that is the key uh, concept and also key business strategy for for Evision to promote. So that is exactly aligned with our topic today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and finally, could I pass it over to Amelie Tan from CDP? Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Emily Tan. I'm regional lead for um, the Commit to Action program at CDP. I also represent the SBTI for corporate engagement in Asia as well as Oceania. So um, the SBTI is actually founded in 2015 as a collaboration between four partner organizations, uh, namely CDP, WRI, uh, UN Global Compact, as well as WWF. Um, so the initiative drives um, ambitious climate action in the private sector by en en uh, enabling companies to set emissions reduction targets, uh, which are validated against uh, the latest climate science. 
and which are consistent with the Paris Agreement to halve emissions, um, global emissions by 2030 and achieve net zero by 2050. So uh, we now count close to 2,000 companies that have joined uh, the SBTI so far, and together they represent uh, some of the biggest companies like Mahindra Group um, in, in, you know, in, in various markets, um, covering more than 20% of global market cap. Um, so with the validated targets, you know, companies are encouraged or obliged to um, report on their progress towards their targets um, each year. And the recommended place to do that is CDP, uh, which uh, as of this year um, have included more than 64% of global market cap to disclose to us. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. I'm happy to contribute to the conversation and uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Emily. Right, well, that was great to understand a little bit more about who we have with us today, but um, let's move on to the questions so we can start to drill into some of the elements that you are you're doing in your organizations. So like I said, said, we're going to really begin with getting started. So this might be a recent memory for you guys or a long distant memory, depending on uh, depending on how long it's been since you've been really focusing on this. So um, if I could ask uh, Judy Zhao to really kind of talk through Decathlon's approach and what there were their first steps on, on their sustainability journey and what are you, would you say is the motivations for your business um, at, right at the beginning? What motivated you to get, really get started? Mm -hmm. So thanks. Um, actually, the customer started, uh, started to start this topic many years ago, several years ago. And in uh, two, uh, 2019, uh, we, our uh, scope one and two sample targets had been validated. And uh, this year, the scope three the targets validated this year. And at the uh, same time, we joined the Renewable Energy 100 and we raised um, another very ambitious target to contribute carbon uh, neutrality. So, um, SD is really a um, main strategy in the company, uh, which impacts actually everybody from our top, from uh, our board, shareholders, to uh, every colleagues, even our upstream and downstream value chain. So it's a really key strategy in uh, the castle. So we put a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, energy and the efforts on this topic. Mm. And in, in terms of getting your senior leadership brought into this, was that ever a challenge or was this, was this a top-down led initiative um, in Decathlon? Uh, yes, uh, actually from, uh, from top, to, from from a uh, uh, very top, from our stakeholders uh, to ev uh, to our strategies to every details action planning. So we have uh, a, a team to impact everybody to take uh, concrete actions. So uh, that is great. Thank you, Judy. That's great. Um, and if I could ask uh, Anirban to make some comments on that on the on the same question, please. Eloisa's story started 14 years ago. Uh, it started very interestingly. A business analyst asked our chairman and our managing director, do you have a triple bottom line report? We obviously didn't have one then, and we didn't know what it was all about. Mm. So we went looking for uh, what a triple bottom line report really meant, what was asked, uh, expected of organizations, and we discovered that what was expected of organizations was something that was not only good for business, but also good for the planet and the people. That's how we got started. Lots of experiments happened. Uh, we learned that a lot could be done, much more than what we originally thought was possible. And that led us to scaling our uh, ambition, signing up to science-based targets and all of that. Now, as the question was asked to our chairman and managing director, that's where the work started from. So getting senior management involvement was uh, not so much of a problem at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I must say that uh, 14 years ago, the problem was probably perceived more by uh, visionary business leaders than by regular managers. And uh, so any, any organizations that started early has had the benefit of a visionary business leader driving the program and empowering the people of the organization to take action 
on uh, climate in the business. And that's how it went with us as well. That's really interesting. Um, in terms of that business analyst that made that, that first question 14 years ago, would you say that that still has power within your organization or with other organizations, encouraging those at all levels to kind of question question decisions being made uh, around sustainability? Do you think that still has a, a place in um, today? Of course. Uh, it is an evolving field. Uh, what is expected of uh, board members and CEOs and organizations is evolving. Uh, the tool of asking questions to the right people uh, is not only about asking questions, but it's also about building knowledge and building awareness of what is required. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, people who are attending the next Davos conference in January, they are being asked what is going to be the carbon footprint of your travel and are you offsetting it if you are how are you doing it now i'm sure a lot of the attendees would not have thought about offsetting the emissions okay. from their travel if they had not been asked the question so this method of asking the right question which incidentally is what cdp does in its questionnaire as well every year you'll see some new question that would pop up and you will realize, oh, this needs to be done too. And so I think it's a wonderful way of uh, keeping the ecosystem going. That's great, keeping you on your toes. <laughs> um, and I think in front of us here, we have um, organizations that are definitely ambitious. You know, we, um, in, we have uh, Envision um, who are signed up to kind of Paris uh, on the 1.5 limit, it's SPTIs, Mahindra are, are engaging with their carbon neutrality goal out to 2040, um, Decathlon you know, looking at 90% of its suppliers um, are going to set science by targets by 2024. These are huge goals and very admirable and inc in incredibly ambitious and from an organization like Carbon Trust we really we really um, commend this and we want to see more of it but I think it would be great to dig in a little bit on what were the key influences for you to develop such ambition climate change targets? What is um, the importance of those carbon footprints and net zero targets to your company? Um, um, and if I could um, ask Hui Dong to start with that, that would be great. Thanks. Uh, yes, I think the uh, in vision, we are very motivated in terms of sustainability journey. So in fact, the, since our funding uh, in 2007 and the in vision, Emission, the, the group's emission, uh, the uh, sorry, the group's emission has always been to solve the challenge for the sustainable future. So that they uh, has been uh, defined defined uh, for the, over the past more than ten, uh, ten years. And then uh, our CEO and the senior leadership are very committed to achieving carbon neutral. And that the uh, uh, we have set up a very ambitious target for 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 the uh, group so to achieve the, our uh, carbon neutral in our operations by 2022 uh, so which means the next year and also we want to uh, become the first company in china to be, to be the carbon neutral throughout our all our whole value chain by 2028 so we want to see those kind of uh, targets are extremely uh, ambitious but we uh, uh, being a, a, a green tech company, so we, we, we do believe we, we, we can achieve that. And also even beyond that to achieve with the uh, individual, but also we can be the, a partner with other companies with our sort of set of solutions, our product, our, our, our solutions, something like that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, and yeah, I suppose your the fundamentals of your business as a green tech. You know, you're draw, you're at the front, you're at the, the 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 forward edge there, pushing towards that greener future and hoping that your technology solutions can play a yeah. part of it. Um, Emily um, Tan from CDP. Uh, last but not least, it'd be great to uh, hear from you a little bit about what do you and your daily daily life really see as the influences that drive the ambitions behind companies setting SBTI, science-based targets, um, and really kind of going the extra mile um, on these these topics. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I think, you know, setting um, targets or having your carbon footprinting um, sorted as a company 
it's becoming something expected from investors and other stakeholders um, by now, you know. And um, of course, like when the IPCC report came out um, back in 2018 and also in the recent um, special report this year, the science is pretty clear that, you know, we need to keep warming to 1.5. And um, based on current um, pledges and policies in place from governments, we are still not um, at the level that we need to, to keep warming to 1.5, which means the private sector really needs to step up, you know, to close that gap. Um, so, you know, for from the SPTI point of view, we are seeing a lot of companies um, that have established targets in this year alone, um, like more than 60% of them have aligned their scope one and two emissions um, mm -hmm. to 1.5, which is great. Um, and, you know, of course, um, there are there are other um, elements, you know, on how where companies are feeling, you know, the, the request to get these um, targets set. Um, you know, CDP also works with um, our investor signatories um, to, to, to run a campaign requesting companies with the uh, highest uh, uh, carbon emissions and market cap to set their science-based targets. And this year, we managed to sign up um, 220 signatories um, that are requesting 1,600 companies um, to join the SBTI. Um, so, you know, we, we see that usually when there is pressure on a country level or, you know, when there's endorsement from a government level, um, that kind of cascades down to regu uh, regulation and um, mandatory um, reporting uh, as well. Um, actually, a very good example for science-based targets in particular is Japan, um, whose government uh, set its own target to get 100 companies with approved targets by 2020. And, you know, right now they are at, a, at, at 130 plus um, companies that have approved targets, mm -hmm. not just committing, uh, committing to set the targets. So, um, so that's one good example. Um, but also we're seeing um, a lot of movements uh, from the consumer side to ask companies to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, with COP26 coming up, we're also seeing uh, different stakeholders urging governments to step up um, in setting more ambitious targets as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when the, I mean, recently we also see um, a, a, a net zero tracker um, looking at um, NDC commitments, whether they're being updated from, from, last, uh, from the last commitment. Um, from Paris, and we're seeing that it's not enough yet. So, you know, so on one hand, you know, the science is clear. On the other, governments are doing what they can, but, you know, it's not fast enough, which means, you know, the private sector needs to come in. Thank you, Emily. And yeah. what would you say? So one of those com one of those companies that's there's one thousand six hundred companies that's been requested. You are a uh, put your put yourself in the shoes of a um, a senior sustainability manager or someone who's right there, and their company's almost almost moving towards science based targets. What would you give them as advice as practical uh, practical advice mm -hmm. about moving forward there? Um, what are the first steps to kind of really getting started there and pushing pushing forward? What would be your mm -hmm. advice? Well, um, you know, I think a lot of companies have already uh, are familiar <clears throat> with the oh, greenhouse yes. gas protocol. So the SBTI's um, target setting is based on inventories built from the protocol. So getting familiar with that um, and also doing a scope three screening, which is really essential, um, would help companies prepare to understand where are the hotspots um, you know, that exist in the value chain. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because you know, for SBTI, if your we 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 set as a criteria that if your scope three emissions are forty percent or higher um, out of your overall scope one to three emissions, you do need a, a scope three target. So um, you know, the, the screening is also to help companies understand um, across fifteen categories of scope three um, defined by the GHG protocol. Uh, where are your emissions coming from? And mm -hmm. from there, you know, you can. Uh, work towards engaging your value chain, engaging your suppliers, your customers um, to, to understand that, you know, we need to move together to help reduce the value chain emissions because that's kind of where majority of the emissions are coming from. Um, there is a report from CDP supply chain that um, as compared to a company's own um, 
uh, operations, just upstream mm -hmm. emissions in scope three alone, it's about 11 times higher than mm -hmm. your own operational mm -hmm. emissions. So that's where I would ask companies to also look into as well. Great. So get that footprinting yeah. done, understand your baseline, understand your hotspots, move towards net zero or science-based target setting as the, as the next step. Thank you. That's great, Emily. Yeah, um, thank you. And, and open to the floor, um, this one um, really, are any of you seeing any kind of investor market, stakeholder pressures um, um, around these subjects yet? That's yes. a nod from a near band. Fantastic. <laughs> a little bit more than before. Mm, good. We've been doing investor calls for more than six or seven years now. And initially, it was one way information from the organization to the investors, mm. with very little coming in from the other side. But that's changed. And it's changed sharply over the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. So yes, investors are definitely taking much more interest than they ever did before. Yes. So we are uh, from Carbon Trust. We're always talking about future proofing your, your business. And I think this this is definitely a way um, to reduce risk in terms of not being prepared for those questions which are coming and they are inevitably coming um, to you now. So if not already, they will be mm -hmm. soon. So um, it'd be good uh, as well as to, to move towards that question about implementation um let's talk about success stories but let's also talk about failures because learning about failures is also super helpful because we all have them and this isn't a path that's well trod we all have to understand what's 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 gone right and what's gone, gone wrong so um could i ask judy just to make comments on um you know if you've had any real success stories in your sustainability journey so far and any 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 challenges that you'd like to bring forward Mm -hmm. So thanks. Uh, actually, the science-based target for the customer is uh, quite ambitious. We need a lot of, a lot of uh, efforts, internal and external. So, and uh, we need to engage everybody because, uh, especially for Scoop Three, um, it concerns the whole value chain from a product design to to the end of life of the product. It's uh, really uh, the value chains are quite long, especially for us. Uh, the production site or uh, manufacturing of products allocated a lot during the whole value chain and the CO2 emission. So we need to put a lot of uh, efforts um, on our supply chain, especially our suppliers. So uh, the, the, for, for us, I think um, for me, must, most of my honor is that uh, we, we take actions by ourselves. At the same time, we involved and we engaged our suppliers to take strong actions together. Uh, until today, most of our suppliers, uh, they commit their target in the action planning to the castle, which the target is really based on the science-based target methodology. So it is uh, our first step to involve our suppliers to have a clear, measurable target uh, so that guide their, their next actions. Mm. And for sure that uh, we, have a lot, uh, we have a challenges uh, because we know for especially for energy management internally we lack of the competence maybe we need a lot of uh, external resources to support us and uh, for renewable energy uh, we rely um, we are not very clear sometimes the policy of uh, of the of uh, the country mm -hmm. you know in different countries the policy is quite different and even in china we are uh, not very clear about the trend but the policy is uh, have has a big impact to our uh, decisions or our action plans. Mm. So that is. Mm -hmm. Thanks, you, Judy. That's that's really interesting. And if you have never been into a decathlon store, um, you are, then I will let you know that it's an incredibly wide range of products that that decathlon are producing. And so I have a question for you on scale. Um, how do you approach? How have you approached something which is such a a huge task when your supply chain must be very varied um, because the amount of um, equipment that you are producing and the products that you must you must have to source. Do you have any um, comments on, on kind of managing the, the, the scale of the scope three in your supply chain and, and how did you how did you tackle that or, or begin to approach that? Have you had any pushback from any of your suppliers? Uh, 
Uh, now, actually, you know, in uh, Decathlon stores, um, all of our, most of our products is uh, produced by our, by our uh, purchasing department. And uh, we, we are managing all of our uh, suppliers globally. We have uh, more than eight, 800 suppliers actually to produce Decathlon products. It's uh, really a huge task for us to manage so big uh, supply panel. And um, uh, yes, we uh, we have a lot of how to say uh, resources allocated mm. to the supply chain suppliers. At the same time, we have a lot of how to say the the, the encouragement uh, uh, solutions to the suppliers to to motivate the supplier to involve in the the big topic uh, mm. to to awareness first of the supplier how to say uh, how it's how it is important to do energy management. It is a basic, but uh, today most of suppliers are at the very beginning stage actually for this topic. So we need uh, the efforts for the awareness the first, and we guide uh, the actions uh, to them. So uh, we need uh, a lot of efforts on, on this part. Thank you, Judy. That's that's great. Yeah, and a, a very um, daunting task, but it sounds like you're getting really, getting making really good progress there. Um, Hui Dong Zhao, another another organ your organisation is also hugely varied. So I'm um, interesting to understand how you have any challenges you've had on implementation, um, um, or, or any 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 successes that you'd like to bring forward um, of your um, from your journey so far. Uh, yes, I think I want to. I'd like to share the maybe two successful stories. To want to share with all of you, the first one is I just the uh, just last week we have launched a, a we call a standard for the uh, industry park net zero standard. We we mm -hmm. launched that with the uh, DV and the very uh, with the with the, the French company. So that is the maybe it's the first time in the world to have a very clear roadmap, very clear criteria for being so even in the future a bit for certifying the uh, the industry park net zero. So because we believe in the future, and then uh, with the set of the uh, companies, uh, lots of companies, and then they are located in the same industry park with the. Uh, Green energy supplies and also share the uh, loss of the uh, infrastructures, and that will be the, the 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 future to achieve the net zero in terms of the industry. And another thing, a good story is we do believe we do understand that the challenging one of the challenges for the net zero is to collect the data and how do we we collect the data and how do we Convince all the stakeholders, all the transmit kind of data are reliable, and then in vision. So we also we uh, have a very uh, smart uh, product we call the ARC, and then that is the uh, uh, we have uh, this with this system. So we can uh, digitalize and also visualize all the energy consumption and also the carbon emissions to of all the electric uh, electricity. Uh, and and uh, also the gas, the water, heat, mm. uh, steam. So we we, we can see the data, uh, the uh, automatically on the screen on your screen, and also all those kinds of data are, are, are traceable. So that is the uh, we already applied that in uh, one of our industry park in Jiangsu province in Jiangyi in, in, in China, and that they really uh, helpful. So that is the two successful stories we, mm -hmm. I'd like to share with all of you. And uh, in terms of challenges, yes, we do have challenges. The, uh, uh, especially we, because we set up, we already set up the target for next year, for 2020, uh, 2022, to achieve the carbon neutral for the uh, operations. Mm -hmm. And then uh, 2028 for the, uh, Whole value chain, which means scope one, two, plus scope three, and then we have uh, some challenges in China. Is some policy, for example, yeah. the PP, the PPA, the policy. Uh, they still, it's, uh, we have some the difficulties to 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 purchase the, the power from one province to another province. But even for the we call in China, we call the CCER. So that's uh, the 
uh, carb the carbon uh, uh, certificate for the emission reduction that has not been uh, re re restarted yet. So, but we believe in, in China, the government uh, are very active. So in the near future, so all those kinds of things, the barriers will be removed. removed. But another challenge for us is also we have the, uh, the school three. So the 2028 wow. is coming. And then we have that the majority of the emissions, especially for the uh, one of uh, one of the business units, is, uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, the majority is, is the school three. So we are thinking about in terms of the steel for the wind turbine and also for the cement for the, uh, the basement of the wind turbine. So we are now trying to I say, uh, develop some new technology to, to get the uh, uh, more cleaner the steel and even more cleaner the, the cement. Maybe we, we can encourage them to come to, to, into the, the west part of China to be in the industrial park and with the, our green uh, energy solutions. Maybe we can, we can, mm. we can make a better value chain to, to solve this kind of challenges. So that exactly uh, is what we are doing now. Thank you, Quang Dong. That's really interesting. You've touched upon three real key points there in um, in kind of challenges through. One of them is data, um, understanding your data. Um, at Carbon Trust, we love data. Um, and I cannot stress enough that data is one, having a consistent view of what, what's going on is going to help you understand and really crack the nut of, of um, your sustainability journey. And you, what you described, the consistent monitoring is one of those key tools. The other thing you described is policy, of course, and that's something that, that, that Judy also touched upon is understanding where the policy is going to go. But it sounds like you believe in that the, the governments are moving, are, are go only going one direction. There's going to be no retraction there. And I think that's something from a global perspective we see elsewhere. There is going to be different speeds of adoption of policy around this. But it's it. But there's going to be a consistent approach, a consistent direction, and it is coming. It's just about when. And then I think something else that you touched upon there, which is really useful, is industrial energy efficiency and the and the and the embodied carbon um, in some of the products that you and the materials that you're having to use. So steel, the steel you mentioned, about how to ensure that that the embodied carbon in your steel is is less. We have an audience question that's come through, which is, um, I'm sure we'll touch upon a few of those issues, um, directed at an earband from Mahindra. Um, so again, across the Mahindra group, you must have a wide variety of challenges across the multiple sectors, 140 companies I think you have that you're working in. Um, can you provide some examples of your actions and progress in the more hard to abate sectors which you operate? Thanks, Anirba. Thank you, Lois. So, uh, it is a very common question that how do you handle all this across <laughs> different industries? Uh, I find there are more similarities than differences at this point in time. So, across any industry, you're looking at the levers of energy efficiency, renewable energy, carbon removals, reducing emissions at supplier location, uh, reducing emissions during logistics, and so on. Now, how you do that? can vary across industries. So inside the factories, there are very strong programs on energy efficiency that happen. Uh, but the programs on energy efficiency, layer, uh, such as in a construction site, uh, are probably at a lower scale than those at uh, within a factory. But at a construction site, uh, ensuring that you're using renewable energy is a massive challenge because that construction site is a temporary location. You may or may not have access to uh, renewable energy at the location. But without access to renewable energy, very difficult to become uh, net neutral over time. So these are some of the challenges that we face. Uh, we get by by, as of now, we are getting by by doing all that can be done today. And we're keeping our eyes and ears open to see, okay, what are the new things that are happening which can be done in the future. So some concrete examples of uh, factories, buildings, resorts that we work with. Uh, 
pretty much every single light, every single air conditioner, every single fan, every single motor, anything that consumes electricity uh, is getting changed to energy efficient versions. And a lot of these technologies were not available 10 years ago, but they're available now. So the changes can happen. Uh, returns on the investment are good and uh, carbon footprint keeps going down. So you actually reduce operating costs going forward. So that's just one example. There are others uh, in other sectors as well. But when it comes to scope three emissions, I think we should uh, highlighted very important ways of working with suppliers and working with uh, partner industries to be able to bring their emissions down so that the embedded emissions in everything we buy goes down over time. I hope that helps you guys. Definitely, thank you, Nirvan. And delving a little more de de deeper into that, I, I noticed that Mahindra signed up to the um, EP100 initiative and also some other kind of globally recognized almost standards or, or programs or tools. Have you found that useful to set yourself in line with these kind of global initiatives? Is it something that kind of gives you uh, direction, um, gives you something to, to work towards or is, is that been a useful tool for you as an organization? It's helped a lot in building scale, mm. in getting colleagues excited about the nature of work. Uh, initially, when we got started, there were many little projects that were happening. Yeah. And we realized that even without targets, uh, we were increasing energy efficiency by 3 to 4% a year, energy yeah. productivity by 3 to 4% a year. And when EP100 came along, we said, okay, we've got a long term goal now. We are already doing 3 to 4%. If we can step it up a little bit more, that will be wonderful. And so programs like EP100, RE100, they've helped us scale uh, the work that we were doing. A question we kept asking is, how do you know you're doing enough? Uh. So if you have a goal of this kind, it helps. And then SBTI came along. And uh, when you sign up to the science-based targets, you at least know that what you're trying to achieve is aligned to the Paris Accord. So you can tell yourself that, yes, if we achieve these goals, we're probably doing enough. And it's not a case of many success stories, but no success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Anip. And that's really, really useful. We, um, we have an audience question here that I'd like to, to jump to um, for Amelie. Um, what is the best way to conduct scope three screening to identify the, the, the main categories and um, kind of building on what we've already heard from um, uh, the other panelists, how can we best engage suppliers in a multi-tiered value chain where data transparency is the biggest, biggest challenge? It always comes back to the data. <laughs> Exactly. Um, so I think the, the, the first part about, you know, best way to screen scope three emissions um, to, 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 get, to prepare for SBT setting, you know, the SBT I recommends um, uh, a screening tool built by Qantas um, and is available on the Greenhouse Gas Protocol website. So this is essentially a high level screening for companies to understand, um, you know, what, the, what does their scope three emissions uh, look like. But you know, as it as it comes to data quality, um, you know, scope three is notoriously difficult to um, to keep track of, right? So, um, so in, in in setting scope three uh, targets, you know, um, the SBTI actually has a bit more flexibility for companies to to set targets for scope three in particular, um, and that includes supplier engagement targets, which you know ask for um, you know your your tier one suppliers to set science based targets by a certain year. Um, you know, but then when when you do that, you know, you are asking your suppliers to also conduct the same process that you're going through. Um, and so that kind of cascades down to, you know, the value chain. So if your second, third tier suppliers will then look to your first tier suppliers on what their targets are um, in order to meet, um, you know, the requirements. So some companies have um, actually... Um, taken this a little further. So for example, um, HP Enterprise, um, they do they have joined the um, SBTI and um, 
in terms of and supplier engagement, you know, um, they they have set by 2025 um, to have up to 80% of their procurement uh, manufacturing spend um, to go to to suppliers with science-based targets. Um, and they have a, a pretty um, comprehensive program that also asks uh, re rates their suppliers, and that includes um, you know uh, getting their emissions verified um, apart from setting science-based targets. And uh, you know this directs uh, this kind of correlates directly with their procurement decisions. So um, if, if, if a company wants to meaningfully engage their suppliers, they can set um, requirements like this. But, you know, the, the, the scope 3 data will need to be, will, will be improving, like, you know, as you continue to engage your suppliers for companies. So um, one of the things that, you know, the, the, the SPTI uh, wants companies to do as well is after you have set your target, that is not just, that's, that's kind of like the beginning because then you have to report on that target um, every year. And if there is any big structural changes, um, you know, you, the company would then have to re- look at their target and get it revalidated to make sure that it stays relevant. Yep. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, um, um, interesting to hear again you, uh, the, the complexities of it and the procurement being the key tool. Obviously, I think something that Decathlon definitely has that ha has used procurement as a tool, so it's good to hear that being backed up yeah. by, by, by CDP. Um, can I just add one more thing? Of course, of course. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so one of the things that um, you know, HP, Walmart, and and many other companies that have science-based targets do as well is to sign up for a CDP supply chain program. So in terms of disclosure and data collection, um, their suppliers will then feed the same um, structural data as them. So it becomes really easy for them to assess, you know, um, the progress on their suppliers' emissions uh, that contributes to their own scope three. So that's one way to, to look at it as well. Yeah. And there's one, just to keep you on the floor there, Emily, um, there's one yep. other question that's come through from the audience about um, whether setting these targets um, in is going to limit growth of an organization. And this is something that I, I get asked in my day-to-day -day life is, mm. you know, is, is are SBTs for everybody? Is, it, is there a risk that there's going to be some sort of cap on, on productivity or growth in, 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 this, in this region when some of the companies that are operating, the countries mm. are developing, the companies are developing? What's your response to that? Well, I would say, you know, it is a risk to not have some kind of target in place, you know, right. because um, this is something that um, your customers, um, investors and other stakeholders are looking at or expecting, you know, companies to do. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the targets are not um, set in stone. It is a, a, a target that would have to make sense to the company. So if a company continues to grow, um, then they will have to relook at what is um, a, a target that is um, viable for them, um, and then you know when it when it comes to scope three, where the impact is the highest, um, there is also an option for physical intensity or economic intensity target. So economic intensity really just asks you to um, it's not the most robust target, but then it is one of the option um, that looks at your emissions per dollar value, right? But then I say it's not the most robust because, you know, there are so many elements that go into, um, uh, you know, revenue, income and things like that. But it is one way to kind of um, uh, ensure that it, you do have a target in place um, based on a, a quantifiable um, data point. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I would say, you know, um, uh, one of the things that um, really helps companies to grow in terms of having a target is, to look at alternative products and invest in alternative technology that mm -hmm. can provide, you know, customers a, a different, a lot, you know, lower carbon footprints products. Um, so if let's say the original, um, if, if, a, if a traditional product is already very high in emissions, then um, how can a company capitalize on opportunities in, in the low carbon transition to look at other ways, you know, to sustain the business? Um, and you know, with um, with fossil fuels uh, becoming um, a bit of a contentious issue in terms of uh, supply <laughs> um, mm -hmm. availability, um, and also like renewable energy becoming um, uh, you know a lot more affordable and scalable these days, um, 
how if you if a company doesn't think about um, the opportunities and the risks you know that come together with yeah. the transition then there is um, a very high risk of um, being left behind because mm -hmm. you know your competitors might already be looking into mm -hmm. um, getting ready for the transition not just for um, you know product specific um, changes but also regulatory changes as well yeah. um, as you know we know uh, the TCFD um, disclosures mm -hmm. are becoming more and more common uh, in being adopted as mandatory disclosure um, requ requirement mm -hmm. so um, yeah so a, a, a lot of market forces are moving in a direction towards low carbon so yeah yeah that, that would be my take on that Thanks, Emily. That's fantastic. Yeah. And I think you've used the, the key word there is risk, isn't it? You know, um, where are you seeing the risk? Are you seeing the risk in your business continuity? Are you already seeing the impacts of climate change in your supply chain? How mm -hmm. are you going to innovate back to one of those three pillars of three the many pillars of, of making the changes, looking at innovation, looking at your business model, questioning every everything that you've or, done up until now um, and looking at your the, the growth and the, the changes that are going to happen to your business over the next 5, 10, 20 years. So yeah, that's that's really good advice. Um, Thank you. And I'm conscious that we are swiftly running out of time, which is something <laughs> I always knew would happen. And I'm really keen to hear, um, to, to really delve down in on, on Asia. I mean, we are at the root of the Asia events. So let's talk about Asia. Let's talk about, you know, are there any policy changes, climate change impacts on your your supply chain? Any unique risks, any unique challenges that you're that you're that you're finding? Um, I think we've had a few mentioned there previously. I think Judy and Huangdong have mentioned um, something about policy in in China and the region as well. So, is there anything that you you would like to say um, um, about that? And um, if I could hand over to Huangdong about um, um, on this one, that would be great. Yes, I think the as I just mentioned, the, uh, especially for emission group. So because we have the very ambitious target, so mm -hmm. we are in fact we are looking for the uh, restart the uh, of the CCER. So the China certified emission reduction the uh, the system, but also we we are looking for we are looking forward to uh, having the PPA market uh, opened, mm -hmm. through province to province. Because in China we have a rich okay, resource in the, uh, the west uh, part of China, maybe the west north part of China, but in the southeast it's very it's very challenging. So this kind of policies they do impact the, the, uh, the, the our, our our how to say our target. So how do we achieve this kind of target? With the what kind of quality of the of the of the uh, uh, the, the achievement? But the, on another side, we, we do believe uh, that kind of journey uh, toward a net zero society will also bring untold opportunities for humanity. So this new industrial revolution calls for the creation of a new green industry system. So that is the uh, uh, will bring lots of the new innovations and also with lots of the uh, or the massive the opportunities for the world, so we do we, we do believe, and then uh, in vision. So we have uh, set up lots of the uh, ob objectives. Uh, one side to to how to say uh, to be do better for our individuals to achieve net zero, but the, uh, we think uh, it is even more essential that we work together with others. We stress that we start. We we work. We started with our partners, or even the scope three, but also even much more than the scope three. Yeah? So we to to with the more partners to reach these goals collectively. So mm -hmm. with our products and also our our solutions, mm -hmm. uh, we do believe. Yeah? And then with the uh, more and more companies, more governments, even individuals are committed to mm -hmm. to, to 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 this direction, and then. That will bring a new, very beautiful world. And then for evision, we do want to be the, the world leading uh, partners in terms of net zero technology partner. So that, that, that is uh, what, we, what we are uh, working hardly now on, in this direction. Great. 
Thank you, Fandong. That's fantastic. Yeah, just to say the collaboration and, see, and and keeping an eye on what policy is is going going ahead. And Judy, um, would you like to say anything um, about about this? Uh, yes, actually, uh, just as uh, Emily, say, uh, Emily said, uh, the target mm. setting is just very beginning. It's game starts, so we really need the efforts to approach um, every year's target. So that we need um, a lot of solutions for the market and uh, all of the resources together to go ahead. So for for us, we really rely on the resources, solutions, even the very clear. Uh, policies of uh, the country so supporters go quick thank you great Judy, that's fantastic and i suppose hopefully you're seeing an increase of capacity of the resources that you're working with as time goes on more expertise in the country more accessible to more advice that's helping you that's helping you um in china to to to, to work on that so that's 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 good um um Ilioban, i don't know if you want to say anything on on this one as well well, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Elois, in all these conversations, you would have seen that there are three things that we talk about. Yeah. Technology, policy, and behavior. 100%. Now, uh, <laughs> typically from an Asian perspective, uh, there are some technologies which get developed in the Western world, which take a little time to travel, which is why there are all these conversations at COPS about give us technology, give us money, and we will get the job done. So that's one issue that one one can anticipate in Asia. Uh, in energy efficiency, I'm glad to say that lots of technologies are traveling really fast, which is why we can make progress. When it comes to policy, policy formulation in uh, developing countries, uh, especially those with large populations like India, uh, resource constraint, uh, sometimes the policies take a little time to get going because there are already a lot of incumbent situations which for example in the in the power sector the move to renewable energy is critically dependent not only on the the cost of the technology and the availability but mm. also on how the distribution companies are structured today and there are so many complications that we could spend an entire conversation on how to get rid of it yeah. but and i'm i'm sure that's not only for india it will be there for other developing countries as well and that kind of hinders the pace at which policy can move forward. Again, when it comes to behavior, a lot of it is awareness. And it doesn't help when you are repeating that, you know, we didn't cause the problem, so why do you want us to do things first and so on? Uh, that doesn't help. But over time, you know, as we realize that uh, moving or taking climate action is the safer, better thing to do, not just for nations and organizations, but for people as well. Uh, I guess it just falls into place, but it takes a little bit of time. That, I suppose, is the Asian perspective at this point in time. And Iban, that was really well put, and I think it summarizes some of the, the the challenges that different countries are facing. Governments trying to prioritize many different issues, especially post COVID, ensuring that um, that everything is getting back to normal, kind of economically, but making sure that sustainability and and climate change policies play a, a core role in that recovery um, going forward by balancing, but balancing lots of different demands, ensuring that any new policies are actually implemented in a really strong way and then hoping that this trickle down effect uh, affects behavior as you say um um and i think that would be a, a really good place to to close this session actually with with 2 minutes to spare which i'm very proud of um and i and i'm um, apologies if i didn't get to answer some of the audience questions um there's so much more that we could say today but hopefully what we've provided today is an overview of some examples of highly highly um complex con 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 um, companies t tackling this and I appreciate on the panels today we have um, we have very complex and, and, and leading companies in this field but hopefully what that has done is inspire you as the audience to have a think about your data your footprinting your target setting um, even if you are an SME this isn't just the big companies that need to be that are dealing with this this is this is um, something that's going to affect all businesses all shapes and sizes so hopefully that we've provided some tangible examples and advice for you um, going forward
good. I just want to say thank you so much to our panelists today. It's been fantastic to have you here, such a broad range of organizations and, and companies, and obviously the expert advice from CDP as well about SPDIs and I encourage you all to kind of reach out and get um, and get started on this as well. So thank you for thank you for your time today, and I will now close this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.